All right, well, um, today I'm going to be talking about local content strategy uh, and, and scale with that and creativity. And so the presentation is called Local Content Plus Scale Plus Creativity Equals Awesome. Uh, you can find this on a link. It's on bit.ly forward slash local awesome if you, if you want to pull up the presentation for yourself. And, and it's, if you go to my website, it's, it's right on the blog. Okay, so first off, we work with really big and really small clients, uh, a, a very large mix, some fortune brands, um, all the way down to uh, ma and pa shops. We have another company called Nifty Law, which is 100% which is focused on, on the legal space, and we work with a lot of lawyers uh, in individual markets. But everything is really localized. That's, that's the space I'm in, it's the space I love. Um, now, you know, for other news, this is my grandma. And I love my grandma, and that is me. And as you can see, I'm, I'm a very attractive baby, Gerber style. Uh, I have no idea why I have a red scarlet A on my onesie. A little young for that. Um, but but I, I was raised with my mom and my grandparents, and, and my grandma was somewhat of the discipliner in the family. And this is a newspaper, and she used to when, when I wouldn't listen to her, which was all the time, and I would always mess up, she would roll up the newspaper and she would smack me over the head with it. And she would always say uh, that I like to learn the hard way, okay? And, and that's been like the theme of my life is learning the hard way. Everything I've learned, it's the hard way. I don't, I don't listen to somebody and, and learn. I just always have to mess up, mess up, mess up, mess up, and then be like, oh, here's the lessons that I learned from that. Now I can do this right. And so a lot of my business things have happened that way. A lot of, a lot of my lessons in search have had that way. You know, I learned not to get penalties by getting penalties. I learned um, you know, about how to build websites by building very poor websites, and so on and so forth. So uh, I want to talk to you about these lessons that I've learned. And hopefully, you're a little better than me, and you don't learn the hard way, so that you can, you can uh, learn from these on some of the content strategy that we're dealing with here. So lesson one, local content does not just mean the written word. Okay, I think when we think about uh, content, we, we always just talk about writing. You know, well, well um, you know, what's our cost per word to write content? Well, what's that? Well, this is all local content. Everything you see right here is, is local content. Video, email, ads, products, events, your actual business location, um, people, services, news, listings, images, data, user-generated content. I mean, it's, it's all of these different things. And I see very few people on a local basis using a whole mix of different ideas for their local content. They stick with just written word, okay? And, and so as soon as I started learning that, that just a, a flat out image could be something great, then, then we started to do some really wonderful things. Okay, so lesson two, scale does not mean fast plus easy growth. All right, and, and let's talk about this. You know, when, when I go talk to a client, especially like a national brand or something that has multiple locations, anywhere from 100 to 1,000, they always are, are like this. Well, is this scalable? You know, and you, and you get that, that cheesy look. Well, is this scalable? Is this going to be cheap? Is this this? Well, I started looking at, at, at the definition of scale, okay? And I want to talk about that. Scaling content or scaling anything. Um, and, and this is what I've came up with for understanding scale and content. The growth of additional traffic or revenue, whatever you're measuring, is greater than the growth of additional expense, the time or money uh, plus the tech that goes into each individual additional piece of content, okay? So what that looks like is this. When you start creating content, there's a high probability that the expense of that content will be much greater than the traffic or the revenue generated. But at a certain point, if you're doing things correctly with content, then you should have each additional piece of localized content should be an exponential growth on top of the cost that you have on that. Meaning that, so every additional plus one brings you plus 1.1 or higher, basically, is what I'm saying there. Um, so this is hard to do. But if you can do this, then you can scale local content. And this is what you need to think about when it comes to local content. And, and so 
what does this all boil down to? It boils down to the biggest thing, which is lesson three. You really need a continuous local content strategy. So most of the rest of this presentation is based on, well, what is a local content strategy? And I've, I've tried to build an easy way to understand this, and this is what I came up with, okay? This, this is local content strategy. Uh, this graphic here starts with identifying the local audience, and as you can see, it goes around to the refine and repeat process. But this is a continuous process that can be used over and over and over in building out your local content strategy. And, and it really starts uh, with, with this idea. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I would spend six hours sharpening my ax. It's a wonderful quote from Abraham Lincoln. I, I use it a lot because I'm like the exact opposite normally. I'm like usually ready, shoot, and then aim. And that's so the wrong way to do things, you know? And, and as I've learned this lesson the hard way, we've, we've learned to spend a lot more time in the planning processes um, and, and in the strategizing before we get into the tactics. So, so let's first start talking about identifying a local audience, okay? Um, there's a fantastic tool uh, that's, that's free. You can, you can get a lot more data on the paid end. Um, but the, on, on Nielsen, if you go to bit.ly forward slash local segments, you'll find a tool that helps you identify personas by market. And, and I love this because uh, let's say you, you start working and understanding your persona. If you go to this local segments tool and you find a persona that they've already identified, which they've came up with, I think you know, there's a, a couple hundred personas, um, they've identified the density per market of these different personas. So you can start finding specific markets where the persona that you're targeting is, is at or the other way around. If you want to type in a zip code, you can see the, the types of personas that they've identified in this market. Um, and, and so here's, here's an example of that uh, on, on this one here. And it shows that for this specific, uh, this specific persona, these counties down at the bottom across the United States are where the highest density of that persona would be found. So I mean, this is very, very interesting data. Um, and yet again, the basic aspect of it is free. If you're looking for lots of information for multiple markets, you might, uh, it might be worth paying for to, to get further information. Um, the other tool we use religiously when it comes to um, per, like identifying persona, identifying targets is using the Facebook ad tool and, and uh, the Facebook insights. And in this example specifically, we were looking for uh, a very specific market and that, were, that, that was people interested in modest wedding dresses, okay? And so, of course, you would probably think, where would this be found? Well, Salt Lake City, okay? So, so we started looking into the Salt Lake City market. Um, we typed in some specific interests that they would have, and we came up with a number that you can see down on the bottom here, and that's 1,700, uh, uh, 1700 people, give or take. Uh, then we took that information and put it up against Google Trends to see it, what other markets would be there for the specific keywords, you know, modest wedding dresses and different things. And we found Rexburg, Provo, Salt Lake City, and Boise. Um, so we started to be able to build this model around these locations uh, that that then we went on to match the information using the Google Keyword Tool to see what type of search data would come up. Um, and, and we found, okay, so modest dresses, about 2,000 searches, uh, and, and it started going on from there. And so we started figuring that, okay, this actually starts to paint a really good picture for us. We know there's about 1,700 people at any given time um, that were engaged in, in the market that we were looking at, interested in the same things. And so from a, from a search perspective, they were looking or possibly conducting the search about 2.7 to three times, okay? And so you start to build this idea of the persona and also their search behavior just by combining these different tools, okay? Once we had that, then you can start to create goals and rules around this. Um, and and I, I don't get to spend a ton of time on each of these, on each of these uh, parts here, so I'm just gonna share some of the top tips that I can. So for, when it comes to goals and rules, there's a book that I think everybody should read, and that is Content Strategy for the Web. 
Um, and a great quote from that is, it's critical for each person to know what their role is and how it fits into the larger content process. When it comes to goals and rules, especially with localized content, it can get very technical. Um, for instance, if you have multiple markets you're targeting after, then is, is there only one person that's posting content or do you have people in each market potentially a branch manager, something like this, that, that is posting across social or across the website at different times. How often is that done? What are the rules around the, uh, the brand, uh, the voice guide, all of these different things? And all of that comes into this creating goals and rules. Once you understand your audience and once you figure out who you're going to target, what are the rules that you're gonna establish around that? Um, I, I think that you can identify a lot of these on your own, uh, but but read that book, Content Strategy for the Web, because I, you, you'll find a really good framework for doing that. Okay, um, moving on, uh, audit and analyzing what you currently have. There's a couple of tools that I wanted to mention that we use, especially for sites that have multiple, you know, a lot of locations or a lot of pages. Um, one is SiteLiner.com. Um, and, and what you can do, you can drop in a domain and they'll look across the domain and identify all the duplicate content, all the page titles, all the total uh, keyword count per page, and help you identify you know, a rough percentage of what internally duplicated content there might be. And, and we use this a lot in local because there's a ton of duplicate content across local pages that usually needs to be cleaned up when we come to, to a site. So a uh, very fantastic tool there for audit and analyzing uh, the current local pages. URL profiler, um, this along with um, the, uh, oh, I'm just, just forgot the name, Screaming Frog, Screaming Frog tool. They both have some very great features. What I like about URL Profiler is that they, they have some connections into Majestic SEO and some other tools that can show you links per page, shares per page, uh, a bunch of things. And they have a free, I think there's a free 15 day trial or something uh, for this tool if you would want to give it a spin. And, and try out, but uh, you drop in a website or, or you can get the list of URLs for the entire site, drop those in uh, and get a breakdown uh, down to the individual page, what the share count is, what the link count is to start identifying what pages are going to be you know, your most bread and butter local pages to work with. Okay, next, and, and what we'll spend the most time on, uh, once, you're doing, once you do these things, you go through these first processes, then you're finally to the point where you know what you have, you know who you're targeting, you know the rules around what you can do, and you can start to develop your tactics. Okay, and, and this is usually the part that everybody's like, oh yeah, you know, this is what I'm really looking to do, this is what I'm excited about. Um, but, my, you know, I, my, I, I have a message for you, and actually it's my son, this is my son, his, his name's Joshua, and he's dressed up as a Nigo Montoya for Halloween from The Princess Bride. Now, it, I mean, I don't, I don't know how more intense it gets <laughs> to, to dress up as a Nigo Montoya. And so, if, if, you, uh, you know, if you jump into tactics too soon, then he says to you, prepare to die. And that is very true. If you go right into tactics without the planning, you probably will fail. Um, so, so now, you know, Make sure you do the planning. Follow Abraham Lincoln's advice. Spend your eight hours uh, or six hours sharpening your axe before you spend the two hours chopping the tree. Um, and, and here, we'll get into some examples of, of great local content in different ways. Um, so a brand that I think does a fantastic job is Marriott. Uh, they have wonderful localized sites for each of their hotels, um, but but one of the things that stands out to me here, and I've got a screenshot of the entire local experience or landing page that you have for the Burley location where I live, they have very amazing imagery. And it's not stock imagery of just some random hotel. It's actual professional imagery of the specific location, the specific rooms, the outside of the building. So you know exactly what you are going to expect when you go there. Um, their content is very well geared after a traveler that would be coming into that location. They talk about a lot of the surrounding activities, things to do, uh, things that makes Burley an interesting and unique place. And so it, it's not content that would be great for somebody in the market, but it is great for somebody traveling to that market uh, to see. Um, they have another thing that they've done that I thought was really great is they publish every review on their website. So they have their own review portal, con which allows them to control um, all the reviews that come through. But even if they get a negative review, 
they'll publish that directly on their own site. And so in this example, they publish you know, a two-star review, but the hotel manager was able to follow up and, and really show class by saying, I'm sorry your stay was bad. We would love if next time you come through, we could offer you a potential free upgrade or offer you this or offer you that. And so, so by doing this, they probably keep a lot of negative reviews off of sites that they have less control over, such as Yelp or Google or TripAdvisor, something like that. And they can control the experience here and also get the data behind the reviewer, which I think is interesting. So, so great local content. A, a great example of user-generated content here on a, on a local website. Um, another example, just a localized company in our market is Safelink. Their content is really good because it's so specific to the market. The only people that, that are going to get this are people from Burley, Idaho. And, and they talk, you know, there's a couple little phenomenons in our market. We have Burley Buy, Sale, and Trade, which is just a Facebook group that has almost everybody in our town that posts like the crappiest things on there to sell that cost less than $5 and people love it, like used socks, you know. And, and, and they'll, they'll be $3 and somebody's willing to drive across town. To, to buy those, but, but it's a phenomenon locally. And so by talking about some of these things or talking about the streets that are important in the, into the town, it comes across as, as content that, that's very geared after that local market. Um, and, and another thing that they did was in the Boise market, they went after the, the Broncos, a, a really easy thing to go after, which is the local sports team, because everybody loves them. So by, by showing something in common there, uh, they found some common ground. Um, the other thing was they got local reviews from famous people. Uh, or, or prominent people. This was a, a really well-known philanthropist and, and doctor in our area that, that left a review for them about some of the things that he's done and different things. And so hitting that page, instantly people are going to know him and his recommendation for this company is going to go a very long ways. Um, Groupon uses data very well. So on this right here, this is for their Salt Lake City page, they, they basically took some of the deals or the data behind the deals that, sh that sold the most of and most repeated and were able to create content around, around those deals, saying, oh, a really hot place to go is this, you know, because of this. And all they did was basically look at what they sold the most. It's not like they, they had the insider information. They just knew it from the data from their own, their own sales, um, which was a great idea on Groupon's front. So it's, it's really important to understand this. Local content is not just about being unique. It's about being local and useful. And I want to talk about what it means to be local for one and what it means to be useful for the other. So here's some things that are local, OK? Sports teams, well-known people in the community, different groups and events. These are things that local people love. You know, and, and that they feel a connection to no matter what. As far as things that are useful, you have directions, you have favorite spots in the city, you have really big details that people aren't going to know about um, unless they've grown up in the area or it's been handed down information. This is the type of data you've got to mine out of a, out of a specific location to come across as local. And, and if you can do this, and if you can find this data, then even if you're not in that market, you start to make yourself local. And you can find this um, largely, let's say you have branches in, in different cities or something like that, uh, then use the people that are there. Use your employees wherever they're at to get this localized information. If you're working with a client across the country and you don't know that market, then use that client. Do surveys to get as much information as you can so that you know how to talk to that local audience and you know what will appeal to them. Um, and, and then the, the next biggest piece that I've learned from, from dealing with you know, especially scaling across multiple locations, is that you have to focus on one location at a time until you figure out a winning strategy and a, and a, and a winning system, and then go crazy on the other markets. You know, you don't need to build the plan all at once for every single market. Really test and use markets to test things, and then, and then wait to, to ramp up that process across to other markets until you find something that really works. And a great example of that is Airbnb. Uh, they have these neighborhood pages that I just think are, are fantastic. Um, and, and you can see for all the markets Airbnb's in, these are the only neighborhoods that they've, that they've worked on. 
And you can see that's a small number, but they're taking the time to do it correctly. And so you can see they just added uh, Seoul, Korea as, as their newest one. And I've been following this page for well over a year now. Uh, but what they do is they go into each one of these neighborhoods. So this is Hell's Kitchen in New York. And they get a local photographer to go and take pictures. You know, and, and they just get really, really great pictures in every one of these different neighborhoods. And they build out these pages with a little bit of content written about each one of the pictures. And how do they do that? Well, it's very simple. This is their photographer for Hell's Kitchen, uh, Julia Robbs. They've contacted somebody in that local market. They said, hey, you know the area. You go out. You take the pictures. Maybe write a little snippet. We'll clean it up. And we have really great, wonderful local content that can help uh, give inside information. You know, now, is that scalable? According to our definition, yes, it is. But if we were trying to scale across every single one of Airbnb's locations all at once, they would have never came up with this idea. But instead, they actually came up with content that matters and performs very, very well. And if you start looking at neighborhood guides, if you look up neighborhood guides in any of the markets that they're in, you will see, you will see their pages doing very, very well in the search results. Um, here's an example of a company that's only targeting one location, and that's Boise. And uh, they did, uh, this, is, this is for basically curating local content. So every Christmas event in the Boise area, uh, this company made a list, and, and uh, they used Facebook ads to promote this list. They ended up with 1,600 shares, thousands and thousands of visitors, just by appealing to that local market. Now, how did, this, how did the Christmas events relate to them? They were a, um, they're, they're a housing company, but they did things that were relevant for families. You know, here's, here's things families can do in the Boise area, because who do they sell houses to? Families. Uh, very, very well received and something that they've continued to use each year to update this list. And it performs extremely well and brings a lot of uh, traffic to the site to build the brand up uh, that they wouldn't get initially until somebody was interested in looking for a house. But instead, now they're getting in front of the right demographics and their right personas. Okay, um, here's another idea that's, that's been really fantastic, what I would like to call reverse infographicking. And the idea here is this is a search for Portland infographics. The funny thing about infographics is they don't index very well, as you're aware, they're an image. And usually when people build an infographic, they don't take the content and put it in an HTML format. And so since most of an infographic is usually curated content anyways, you can go and look up infographics in Portland or any other city and just basically take some of the data that they've found, find the original sources, write out the content in HTML format, and you've just taken a really good research piece of content and made it totally indexable without necessarily breaking any type of copyright things. Plus, if you need to, you can link to the infographic or even show it on your own site. But you're the one that's going to have the HTML credit for it because you actually took the time to make it out in HTML format compared to image format. Um, very, very easy thing to do. And if you look in any market at this point, any city in America, practically, you'll find multiple infographics that you can do this with, or find data on those uh, that, that would be you know, relevant to you somehow in a specific city. Um, here's a company that I really, really love on, on the local content side, um, and I wish I could say their name right. It's like, Mo I've said Movato, Movatu, I don't know exactly how, how they pronounce it, but um, anyhow, what they do is lists. They basically take a BuzzFeed approach to local, and, and they, they do a ton of different type of lists for every market. So here, Boiseans, 10, stere or 10 Boise stereotypes that are completely accurate. How many views? 60,000, okay? Look at this one. This one is in um, Salt Lake. 25 reasons to move to Salt Lake City, 65,000. You wanna know who shares this? People who live there, because they are extremely proud of their own town. You know, and I use this all the time locally. I'm involved in a lot of little local clubs. We've just driven in Burley, there's like 10,000 people, and we've had about 10,000 visitors come to our website over the last few weeks because we're putting on a play, and I've been doing stupid little lists like this um, for, the, for the city of Burley, and people love it because it's their local town and they want to share about it. They want, to, they want their friends that don't live there to see it, and they want their friends that, that do live there to see it and share it the, just the same. And so um, they also do a great job with, with videos. 
um, what they do is they take like funny, only you know a little bit well known things like like uh, pronounce this Hawaii place name. So this is different places you know in Hawaii that nobody knows how to pronounce, and they ha they'll have people not from that area start to pronounce that. I'm sure there's things like that in Portland where only somebody from Portland knows how to say it correctly, or they know how to do something correctly, or something you know. And and so you start creating content around this, and the locals love it because they love to make fun of people who don't know something that they know, basically. Um, but, but they've just created this and scaled it from city to city to city to city to city, and it's worked fantastic. Just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of visitors, millions, for this website just by taking the BuzzFeed approach and, and, and taking a local approach to the content that they're using. Okay, um, REI, I think they're fantastic when it comes to events. Uh, they, they've really mastered the art of local events and how to use that uh, on their online presence. Uh, almost every local company that I know does some type of event or is involved in some type of event, but they rarely talk about those events on either their blog or they don't have a section on their site that really can, can um, you know, showcase these events. And marking up events in schema can also give you additional, uh, additional space within search results by showing that. And, the, and I thought something that was interesting, and I, I don't know if they did it, but if you looked up Search Fest page, you'll find in the Google search result that, that it's actually coded to show the location at, at the Sentinel Hotel, and I imagine that was done with schema, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Was that, yeah, I mean, it was really sweet. And, and you're picking up additional space in the search results, um, but it also adds a local relevance to that event and, and gives Search Fest a little leg up. So um, bottom line, you need to think like a local directory. There's a reason that local directories dominate local search results. So let's take a look at TripAdvisor. Um, the most popular page on TripAdvisor that I always see if I'm, if I'm traveling to a city and I'm looking for different things is that things to do page, right? You'll see it at the top of almost every city search that you can imagine. And do you think that that's found or showcased on some TripAdvisor blog? No, it's built right into the, loca uh, the location directory of that city. So this is Salt Lake City main hub page. Where's the thing to do page? It's linked right under the attractions. It's not hidden away on a blog. They've actually built out a local directory the way that it should be. And I think this is something that a lot of uh, uh, companies miss is that they just want to put all their local fun content on a blog instead of directly link somehow to the location pages uh, of that specific uh, location. Um, so another company that does a fantastic job of this, probably the best, is Yelp. Yelp dominates local. It, it, you will not find a company that probably holds more local real estate other than Google who have forced themselves into the local real estate than Yelp. Um, and Yelp does this. Look at all of the local things they have on a specific location page. They have uh, recent local activity taking place, which is the local images being uploaded, reviews, everything like that. They show local events. They show local lists. They show local questions all from this category page, and this one happens to be the Salt Lake location as well. And so you can see that by building this out, they show so much relevance around this location. And I think we're structuring sites fairly poorly when it comes to just only having maybe one location page, but then putting all of this other local relevant information either on a blog or not really specifically attached to that, that location page. Um, so I think you know, you've got to learn to do it like the directories and build out that experience. And if that means that you're making static pages compared to blog pages on a lot of this, that's fine. You know what? It's, it's content. It needs to be in the correct uh, category. It needs to be in the correct folder. And that is usually around a specific city or market. Um, the, the next thing that you have to do is really follow a calendar on content or else you'll find that you do, you're a one-hit wonder compared to hitting, you know, doubles and singles and triples all the time. And so the, the best tool, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time with this, but the best tool that I've found and that we use internally for my agency is Asana. I think it's a fantastic overall project management, calendaring tool, task tool um, for, for any type of agency or any type of team that's functioning and, and producing things on a constant basis, anything that needs to be repeated or anything that needs to have multiple calendars for different reasons, potentially different teams 
or, or data that needs to be sorted a different way. I've, I just haven't found a project tool that, that works as good as that. Um, next, for launching and promoting uh, the content that you have, I, I cannot tell you how much I recommend uh, the Facebook Ads tool enough. I, I mean, when it, comes, when it comes to promoting local content, we have not found anything that can bring as much organic uh, love to something than actually paying for Facebook ads initially to get something started, and then it, it usually produces a lot of organic love because once somebody sees something paid, if they start sharing that organically, it drives a ton. And once they do that, then it brings people to the site that potentially will link to that or share it on their site. And so you start having this whole thing that starts from a paid promotion. Um, and, and I was just talking with Dane about this, and I'm sure she'll spend a lot more time, but like, you can drive down costs so low. On, on a campaign that we're doing currently in my hometown, we got cost, um, cost per action, cost per click, uh, cost per any type of, you know, anything dealing with the ad, down to five cents on average for thousands of clicks. And this is in Burley, Burley, Idaho, you know? I mean, we're, we're bringing a lot of relevant audience and we were bringing a lot of free traffic from all of that a attention and have been able to do some wonderful things uh, to promote. So that tool is a must. Um, it's worth paying. Uh, and then follower wonk for finding the right type of people on Twitter uh, in a local market is great. So right here I was looking up Salt Lake City uh, it was people in the fashion industry in Salt Lake uh, City, and then you can sort the followers, uh, or sort based on followers or a number of different things, so that you can start to identify who you might want to target or who you might want to get your content in front of. So those are just a couple tools used, um, but, but usually people are, are fairly good about creating something, but that whole promotion piece they miss. So they've created wonderful content, but they think that if you build it, they will come, and that's just not the case. Uh, it, it takes either time or money to get your content in front of the right crowd, and, and you're going to have to make sure that that's part of your plan. Um, now for the measuring and reporting, everybody has different things that they look at and every needs different, so I didn't want to get into exactly how to do this more than just telling you what we usually track, and that is revenue or leads by location, traffic by location, and social shares by individual pages or, or per location on the type of content that we're doing. Um, every, every company is going to have different needs on that, but I think you have to break that information down by location so you can see what's working in which markets. Um, next, fairly simply, you have to refine and repeat this process. Okay. And if you do this over and over and over and follow the same little local content strategy guide over and over and over, I can tell you that you'll create amazing content. It won't just be written words. It'll be everything. It'll be all sorts of different ideas. And you'll start to build an audience that goes beyond just search results and, and actually brings you things from every aspect. It'll bring you people from social. It'll bring you people from search. It'll bring you people from word of mouth. And, and, and you'll start to be able to build this cycle. And as you do that, you just create an engine that, that really is a strong, powerful engine that won't be stopped. Um, the problem is if you just stick on that tactics and, and you only do tactics, then you'll find that you have a really awesome one-hit wonder, but then you won't be able to replicate that. So, so think strategy. Think strategy, and, and the big message is you can't fake being local. You have to get the right type of information. And, and it can be hard to find that, but as you look, as you, as you figure out that local crowd, as you work with your clients that are in those local markets, you can get it. And some of the examples I shared were of people doing a fantastic job of doing that. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks, Mike. Uh, up next is going to be Dana DiTomaso, and Dana's going to share a little bit about her agency's process for content development, if I can find her slides. I'll just wing it. There we go. So please welcome up Dana DiTomaso. Good morning. All right. Do I sound okay in the back? Am I leaning towards, am I leaning in enough? All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is our agency's process and how we walk with, through with clients on creating um, not just the content strategy, but what the heck we're going to be writing about, how we're going to be writing about it, where it's going to get put, um, how we're going to promote it, as Mike said with the Facebook promotion stuff, uh, and just 
all the content planning pieces so that we make sure that not only do we have a nice content strategy, but then content actually happens. I find that with a lot of clients, you can write you know, really great content strategies and then you start to do it and the client's like, oh, I'm really busy, I can't help you out with this and there's no backup plan to actually make stuff happen. They don't get excited about a schedule and then your beautiful strategy sits there in a drawer and nothing actually gets executed. I'm sure that's never happened to anyone here, right? You know, it's uh, When I first started in the industry in 2002, I did website development. It was always the number one thing that would hold up websites as content, right? And so we started saying that you can't, uh, you're not allowed to see any designs until you give us the content, and it would just mean that we just wouldn't have to do design for months and months and months. It was great. But it's, content is always a struggle. People think that they have more time for it. I mean, us, I looked at our website, we haven't blogged since December, and we're a marketing company. So <laughs> content is hard. And so this is our process to help clients feel a little less intimidated by the idea of coming up with uh, all the different pieces of content that we need in order for their marketing strategy to be successful and to make them feel really involved and engaged in the process. So the first question that we start with a client is, is how. And for us, the how is a brand voice. And the brand voice statement is really a key part of our digital marketing strategies. It helps the client say, these are the kinds of words that you'll be using when you are talking to someone. And it isn't just for social media, and it isn't just for content. This is if somebody walks into the location and talks to your customer service representatives, if somebody calls into your business, if you're sending out documents to a client to explain your process, like all the different touch points that a customer has with your company, this brand voice brings it all together. I'm actually going to be talking about this at MozCon, so it's something we're really passionate about right now, is all these different touch points and bringing them all together and having that consistency. So there isn't this beautifully crafted content, and as soon as you pick up the phone and call the location, they're like, what do you want? Right? Which, if that's your brand voice, cool. You know, but it isn't usually. And, and your brand voice can be anything, too. It doesn't have to be this like super peppy, lots of exclamation marks kind of brand voice. It doesn't have to be really professional and staid and boring. You know, there's um, a great example, actually, and we were tweeting about this last week. There's a pharmacy in Nova Scotia called uh, Scotia Pharmacy, and their brand voice is all caps all the time. And I think it is probably my favorite Twitter account. And they have a sister pharmacy uh, who also does all caps all the time. And they promised that they were giving out eternal damnation to their 666 follower, which we tricked my business partner into being. She's really excited at me right now. Um, but that's their brand voice. And it's funny and it's hilarious. And if I ever go to Halifax, I am going to go to this pharmacy, even though that's not on my list of things to see in Halifax. There's lots of other cool things. But because they have such a strong brand voice and that personality, I have to go into the store to experience that. So hopefully your brand voice will inspire that. The other things that brand voice can do for you is provide voice consistency between individuals. So sometimes there's one person who does all the social media and then they go on vacation and then somebody else does it and you can just, there's a real inequality, right? Um, Obviously, a brand voice would avoid that. <laughs> so it answers questions like, would our brand say awesome? We actually had a client ask us that once. We're not sure if uh, it's a conference center in Edmonton. We're not sure if the Shaw Conference Center would say awesome on social media. We're like, let's figure that out. Let's see if that is something that's in keeping with the brand voice. Um, it also builds familiarity. Like, I know this pharmacy's tweets because if I see an all caps tweet go by, it's probably them. Because not a lot of people tweet in all caps all the time. Um, so it, it, people will get familiar with you. People will feel good about you, right? And uh, Joanna Lord has a presentation going on that just finished right before this at the same time as this, unfortunately, but talking about uh, how you can get people to feel about your brand through this consistency and through the striking emotion, but your brand voice is a big part of that emotion. And then, of course, it makes it interesting. You're not the same as every other place out there. You know, you can stand out a little bit, but in ways that are meaningful for your brand and meaningful for your customers. And it means that it's, you, know, you can't conceivably service every person in the world who might want to buy your stuff. So it's OK to stand out a little bit and say, you are not the right customer for me. You are the right customer for me. So for example, on our website, um, when you go to the Kickpoint website, we have a video. And in that video, we talk about marketing bullshit. And um, our website got posted to Reddit under our web design when it was launched. And then somebody said, oh, I can't believe they say bullshit in their video. That's so unprofessional. I would never hire them. And so I registered a Reddit account under the Kickpoint brand. I was like, well, if bullshit offends you, you probably shouldn't work with us. And <laughs> then it just like, flame war. So that was really fun. But that's. But clients have said to us, I watched your video, and I love that you said that. And 
people. And then we got a annoyed email from someone who said, well, I was going to hire you, but you said that, and I find that offensive. We're like, well, you're probably going to be offended by us. It's a, it's a really nice differentiator for, for us personally. And so that's what we try to work with clients on. But it's hard to say, I know I'm going to turn away clients because of this choice that I'm making, but the clients that I do get are going to be more passionate about us because I'm taking a stand, right? So when we're working with a client on a brand voice, before we get to all the content crap, um, this is a chart that we use that was made originally by Stephanie Nichols. Um, and it's all over the internet now, of course. It's really great. But showing the four segments of the brand voice, the character, the persona, the tone, the language, and the purpose. This is all really key. And a lot of people focus on just the tone. And they don't think about the other pieces that are involved. They don't think about, you know, what, what, what is the point of us being on social media? What kind of character, if our business was a person, who would it be? And what kind of words would they say? And then you can kind of visualize, oh, it's a persona for the business and, and not just your customers. And so you can visualize the kinds of things that they would say. What kind of language would they have? What makes sense to your audience? Does, does your audience really respond well to jargon? You know, are we an IT services company? Then probably that's the kind of thing that we want to get into. Um, and then, of course, who are we going to be talking to? And that's where you get into building personas, which Mike talked quite a lot about, so I don't want to go too in-depth on it. But in addition to the tools that uh, Mike mentioned, um, we actually write little biography-type personas. And I have an example here. It's probably, I don't know if you guys can read it or not, but um, it is, the slides are online. I did tweet out a link to grab them there on SlideShare if you want to read this over later. We write these little biographies and we tell little stories. This is actually just a, a snippet of the bigger story. And sometimes we'll provide a sample headshot as well so you can really visualize the guy. But reading these, the client really starts to get a sense of, oh, you know, and sometimes they'll say, yeah, I know this client, actually. I can think of a client who is exactly like this guy. And again, this is for the conference center, is the sample here, basically taking through their process. Um, so they have a whole bunch of different personas, but one of them is this poor sucker on the Rotary Club who got stuck with booking the, their annual banquet and because he missed a meeting. And so now he has to deal with it and he's really not excited about it. And this is one of their staple customers that they work with. And so this persona gives a sense of like, what kind of content is Trevor going to respond to? Is he even on Facebook? Does he care if we do Facebook promotion? How is he going to find the kind of content that says Shaw Conference Center is the right place to host your event? It's probably on his list, but how do we convince him that we are the place to go and not this hotel with a really sweet deal down the street? So that's the kind of content we're creating, knowing that this is what Trevor needs. So now we get to the brainstorming process. And we do post-its, so we don't actually do post-its yet. This is a real picture of real post-its from the outcome of one of our planning sessions. Um, but don't leap right into the post-its. So when we actually sit down and it's post-it time and they get really excited because you see the piles of post-its on the table and all the Sharpies are like, I get to write down things. I don't have to work. It's great. Um, <laughs> and we bring donuts, um, we usually try to set some ground rules before we get started. And some of the ground rules really depend on the client and the kind of dynamics that the client has with other departments. So this will obviously depend on how things go at the client, but a lot of this is psychology at your end too. Really observe how the room is feeling. Are there a couple people sitting away from everybody else who are like, this is crap and I don't want to do this. It's stupid marketing stuff and I don't think marketing works. So for those people, I would recommend saying something like, let's all keep an open mind. Um, try to avoid side conversations. And if people are really prone to side conversations, like write that down and stick it up on a wall somewhere to remind them no side conversations because it can really derail the brainstorming process. You're supposed to be you know, coming up with stuff, but we're not going to flesh it all out then. Obviously, there are some ideas that people are going to get really excited about, and then they'll start talking about it, but then we're also shortchanging all the other ideas that could come out of that brainstorming process if we just fixate on one thing. One thing is one, there's multitudes of content that should come out of this. We can't just build our entire strategy around one really piece of, great piece of content that your client get really excited about, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be your kingpin of your strategy, right? So try to set the stage a little bit. Bring food, of course. Food always helps. Um, and then we also start by reviewing our goals and KPIs with the client. 
Um, I did talk uh, at MozCon last year and then a Whiteboard Friday about our goals and KPI process. I would recommend looking at that because obviously I don't have time to cover that here. But breaking down the goals and KPIs into those individual pieces can be really useful for clients so they don't get fixated on things like, wow, people are really going to Facebook share this. Well, I don't really give a crap. Like, are we going to be able to turn those Facebook shares into actual business or whatever? You know, if your goal is to get likes, then great. You know, post about llamas all day. But if your goal is to actually, um, I'm actually talking, so Mike mentioned CBC Edmonton, my tech column. Um, I was just, I poked, peeked at my email before I got up here and my producer just wrote me and said, we're going to talk about llamas in the dress. It's like, yeah, that's what my tech column's about. But, you know, lots of people are going to listen, which is the goal of the show. So, <laughs> so review the goals and the KPIs with the client. Get them to really focus on why we're here and understand it other than let's just write crap. So bring that, that goal focus to it. Review the personas as well. It might be a long time between the personas being written, because usually we start at the beginning with the personas and the brand voice, and the content happens you know, after the keyword research and after we figure out the client's resources. And so there might be a, a gap of a month or two in between that happening and us doing this content brainstorming session. So it's always good to read it out ahead of time. We try to print them out on big boards and bring them into the client so that they can review and be like, oh, yeah, I remember that Trevor guy, and I remember this woman, the event planner. And so it helps them get back into that mode again. And then we also go over the basic content formula. Again, we make this big and paste it up. I am a blank who wants to learn more about blank so I can blank. Every piece of content that you create should answer this basic content formula. And I think that this makes it really easy for clients to understand exactly what their purpose is. I am a persona goes here who wants to learn more about service, product, whatever, so I can you know, give you money in theory. <laughs> but that's usually not what we write out. And sometimes we'll write out a few of these to help people get started. And then we also explain the 70-20-10 rule, which if you're not familiar with it, 70% of your content is that easy stuff that you can sit down and bang out an hour um, just writing about stuff. Like it's you know basic questions, uh, FAQs. I'll show our spreadsheet a little bit later and you'll see some of the 70% stuff that came out of our session. 20% is that more moderate effort. Uh, the stuff that's going to take you some research and maybe a couple weeks to make happen, maybe some interviews, maybe some video, something that's a little bit more effort. And then 10% are those mega pieces of content that might take six months or more to make happen. So when I'm thinking about these mega pieces of content, for example, Moz's Beginner Guide to SEO, that's a 10% piece, right? Um, there could be a series that ends up being a 10% piece. So we did the 12 Days of Edmonton blog series on our blog, and that was a ton of work to publish every single day about a different topic in the city, get people involved, get photos, talk to all these different kinds of people. Enormously successful for us to build up a remarketing audience in the Edmonton community, which was part of our goal for this project, to go from uh, 400 people in our Facebook remarketing audience to about 5,000 people in our Facebook remarketing audience, for Edmonton specifically, get more people aware of us in the local community. So I do a lot of these speaking engagements, but they're elsewhere. They're not in the city. So it's like, who's these kickpoint people? Um, and that's a big 10% piece of content. So 10% too, don't think of it as just one piece. It can be multiple pieces that all come together as well, but it requires a lot of effort and it's more of an all hands on deck kind of piece. Uh, we're running a piece right now for the Shaw Conference Center. So you guys know Crash Dice? Have you heard of this thing? Red Bull? Okay, so Crash Dice is, I know, it's, it's crazy. You should watch it. It's a lot of fun. Um, Crash Dice is, they basically make a, it's like ski cross combined with skating, like ice skating. And so they make this sloped, curved track down a hill, and you fly down at it like, 60 kilometers an hour, and I have no idea how to translate that into miles, sorry. Uh, anyway, it's very fast, it's very fun. They do it all over the US, a little bit in Europe. It is coming to Edmonton for the first time. Our client is the place where they are building the track. So we made this whole strategy around it, a lot of 10% pieces for this to get people excited about the conference center. Uh, one of them is installing a webcam on the outside so you can actually go on the website and watch the construction on live stream as it happens, which is a lot of fun, and we're probably just gonna leave the webcam up there. So webcams are really great content as well. It can be a 10% piece because it takes a lot of technology to get the IT team on board with setting up live stream, et cetera. But once it's there, it's running, you can use it again and again and capture some really fun stuff on it. So. 
Um, and then we also talk to them about the difficulty of making sure that you bring all these pieces together. So personas, ideas, effort, budget, and goals. If you just have personas and ideas, you have, don't have any follow through. If you just have ideas and effort, you're missing the target. If you just have goals and effort, you have no life. <laughs> if you have personas and goals, you have the same crap as everybody else. And of course, all these four things come together to create a really fantastic content strategy. So we also show the clients this and, and illustrate to them why these four pieces are so key to come all together. And then again, when you do the session, obviously offering food is a good incentive to get people to come, but try to bring as many people from as many different departments together as possible. Not just your marketing people or the person who manages social media or the owner, but get frontline customer service people to come in. Get, you know, uh, at the conference center, we wanted to talk to security. We wanted to talk to the people who run the food service. We wanted to talk to the people who do the event bookings. Of course, marketing and sales is there, but we want to talk to everybody who's involved in a customer experience for this client. And so if you can, like, shut down, if your company is sufficiently small, you could probably shut down the company for half a day and do this. I think it would be great to have everyone's input. People who've only been there a short period of time, people who've been there forever, just get as many people as you can involved. And if you have to do multiple sessions, do it. This is the kind of feedback that you're going to, that will be valuable and be useful for not just a month, but for years. So now that you've got this, then you start the post-it process, which basically involves saying to the client, all right, write down things that you think people are going to want to learn about the company. And so they start to write down stuff, and usually there's like a few ideas they've got built up. You've obviously warned them this is going to happen, and they'll write and write and write, and then they'll be like, I'm out of things to write, and they'll just start of you know, I don't know what I'm going to write. And so um, some of the examples are, so this is again for the conference center, can we bring our own food? This was the uh, food part of the board. Is your Indian food any good? Um, why can't I have local food? Uh, why don't you have a restaurant? Why is your food so expensive? Why aren't there more bars? Why are the bars so far from the stage? Uh, you know, lots of different questions around food and bars and booze. So a lot of this was mostly based on questions, but then when we started to say to them, you know, are you feeling stuck? So this is what we went through to help them. So, you know, what are the most common questions that you answer? A lot of those are the easy stuff that comes out right away. Uh, what's the craziest question you've ever been asked? And there's some really fun stuff. Like, can I have an elephant at my wedding reception, right? And so, like, yeah, we're totally going to write about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so they do a lot of South Asian weddings, and sometimes they ask if they can have, like, animals involved in the wedding, and no, you can't, and here's why. But at least let's have that content on the website. Somebody is going to be interested in that, and it's probably going to be pretty funny to share on social media. So... You know, there's lots of different stuff that you can think about. Um, one of my personal favorites is reading out good and bad reviews out loud. Um, the good ones are people like, oh, we're so great. And then the bad ones are like, that jerk. I'm going to take him down. And they start writing out furiously, like, all the different things that they would say to them. It's like the, I can't remember the French phrase. It's like the thing you think about when you're on the stairs to leave that you should have said to the person. That's, it's, that's basically half the content strategy, right? So read out the bad reviews. Those are always really good, especially the bad reviews where you know that person will never be happy no matter what you do for them. Those are the really good ones to read out to people. Uh, things that you personally don't understand about the client. So why does this happen? Why do you do this? Why is it things set up like this? Why is this department called this? Like all sorts of crazy things that you've always wondered as you go along. And then questions people have about other departments. Sometimes I'll say, okay, accounting, ask security about why they do, let, do stuff like this. You know, or if you've been to something, you know, if you have a friend who's a customer, like find out from them what kind of questions they have about the client. So get them to cross talk to each other. Of course, no side conversations, but it also helps to build more content pieces. And then once you're all done with all the post-its, and you will have lots and lots of post-its, you want to organize by broad topics. So that screenshot I showed was from uh, the food section. And then we break it down by persona, effort, and promotion. So this is the spreadsheet that we end up with. Uh, category, so more like the broad category for this particular thing. That's where we grouped it on the board. The idea in particular and then the implementation, and then the promotion. So the implementation is, is it going to be written? Is it going to be video? Is it an event? What are we going to do? So for example, what came out of this was uh, having a stair climbing club. And so um, the Shaw Conference Center is actually built into a hill, and so there's all these stairs. You start actually at the top of the building is actually not where the meeting rooms are. You start at street level, and then you go down into the river valley along this path that looks like a waterfall. It's quite cool. And then you go down to the meeting rooms at the bottom, but it means that there are tons and tons of stairs. And if you know anything about Edmonton, 
it's very, very cold most of the time. So Indoor Stairs Club is its one of the few places in the city where it's warm and relatively humid, so you can enjoy yourself by running the stairs at lunchtime. So they're setting up a stair climbing club for all the office towers nearby. Um, talking about different community involvement pieces, you know, the Christmas dinner, uh, lots of, I, I want to buy tickets to a concert, but so they get questions like this. Even though you could go to Ticketmaster, no, they, they want to know. Um, you know, why can't the stands face the stage at a concert? Who decorates? What, can I rent decorations? What are the room capacities? Is coat check included? I have a 250 people wedding. Why can't I use Hall D, which capacity is $5,000 or 5,000 people? So it's, you know, for, for Hall D, we're doing a, you know, an actual like showing different numbers of people standing in Hall D by getting a camera up on one of those big crane things to say, here's your wedding with 250 people. Here's the room. This is why you probably shouldn't. Like, you can. We're not going to stop you, but you're not going to have a good time. And so helping people to understand that process. And then, of course, um, give each of those a little of that BuzzFeed feeling. And by BuzzFeed, I don't mean all the gifts in the world. By BuzzFeed, I mean this rating system that BuzzFeed gives to every single one of their articles. One of the reasons why BuzzFeed is so enormously popular is because their pieces, every single one of their pieces makes you feel something, right? Even if it's, I can't believe I just spent 10 minutes reading BuzzFeed articles. Uh, we have the BuzzFeed spiral at our office at about three o'clock. Everybody goes on BuzzFeed, finds the silliest thing that they can, and then we have a good 15 minutes, then we get back to work again. So there's the heart, there's cute, win, oh my god, LOL, WTF, ew, broken heart, fail, trashy, and yes. So we actually assign these BuzzFeed categories to the different content pieces on that spreadsheet to say this is the kind of emotion someone should feel after they read this piece. So something to keep in mind. It's a blog post we're working on. It's going to be out in a couple of months, I promise. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> but talking about the, the BuzzFeed test for content marketing and how you can apply this to your content marketing. And it, the goal here is really to make people feel an emotion. It doesn't have to be a heartwarming emotion. It can be, I am now heartbroken because I couldn't rent Hall D for my 10-person event. Uh, but this is, you want people to feel something. And so it can break out of the whole, you know, I'm talking about tax. We have an accounting client, and they talk a lot about, you know, tax tips for auto dealers is a series that they're doing right now, right? And you think that's kind of boring, but you still want people to feel something. So how do you inject that feeling into the content so people get excited about it? Uh, and then, next step, make a schedule immediately because you're going to lose that momentum if you take longer than a couple of weeks to make that schedule. So we try to start the schedule, you know, as soon as the spreadsheet is compiled, we do that the day after, and then we start on the schedule the next day. And then we start scheduling content immediately so that we can get resources involved, we know who has to be involved, we're not losing any momentum, and we're not letting up on the client. Like, we're committed to content now, and we're going to make this happen. And that's really important to make sure it happens right away. This is what goes into a content schedule. Uh, Mike also posted an example of a great content calendar. We use different content calendaring tools based on the capacities and know-hows of the client. Um, you know, Google Calendar works. So does a spreadsheet. So does CoSchedule. So does Trello. Um, you know, we use Trello personally. There's lots of different content calendaring tools out there, but this is the basics that you need to know. And I think. Promotion is one of the things that's really overlooked in a content calendar. Before we even start writing the content, we know where we're going to be promoting it, how we're going to be promoting it, and what kind of budget we're putting towards that promotion. So we know, for example, that we're going to need X number of visual assets because Facebook and their stupid 20% rule, and we're going to be spending this much on Facebook, and here's the audience that we're going to be promoting it to. And then we can start to look back in the schedule before this piece is going to go out and say, is there anything we can do to make this easier later on? So do we need to start building a remarketing audience now? Is there something else that we need to consider before this other piece of content goes out? And uh, one other thing I would like you to check is make sure that somebody else hasn't done content already on this topic and done it well. Uh, we personally use the Ahrefs Content Explorer, which is a really fun tool. I don't know if a lot of people here have used it yet. I think it's relatively new. But you can type in keywords, and then it comes back with content with share counts, uh, which is really handy. So for example, uh, we used it for Crash Dice Edmonton to say which news outlets in town have written about Crash Dice already. And then we were able to find the social media places where they've shared it, and then we're able to comment as our client on social media and say, oh, hey, we have a live stream. And so now we've got the live stream embedded in most of the major news websites in the city with a link to the live stream and a link to our client's website, because we're just providing a valuable service, nothing about how awesome getting a link is from the local newspaper to your website, right? So, and followed too. 
Uh, and then you also want to provide to the client a before it goes out checklist. Uh, Erica McGill McGilvray made a really fantastic one in the Salesforce blog. I strongly recommend you check it out. Uh, we added a bunch of stuff from hers into our foundational checklist that we provide to clients. Build your own checklist um, from this list and make sure it goes out to clients so they don't forget about things like, does the OG image look any good? I can't even tell you how many times a client has saved a piece of content and they're like, I put it on Facebook and it looks really crappy, but they've already shared it and now there's comments and now we can't take it back because they promoted it too. So, <laughs> checklist, really important. I've gotten close and personal. I've taught every client now how to use the debugger and uh, it's something that I never thought I'd be doing, but here we are. So, before it goes out, make a checklist. And then after that, oh, my GIF isn't working. Oh, no, it's GIF working. Okay, it doesn't work on here. <laughs> I always have to end with a GIF. And oh my god, I read just before I got up here, Leonard Nimoy has passed away. Yeah. Very sad. So let's all have a moment of sadness for Star Trek, even though I am a The Next Generation fan. But anyway, thank you so much for the presentation. And any questions? Are we doing questions now? Yeah. All right, thanks. I think we've got a mic at the back of the room. We have about, uh, let's say, 12 minutes for questions. So just raise your hand and we will come find you. There's one in the middle. Should I just keep, okay, there it is. Uh, thanks, those are both really excellent presentations. Was taking notes furiously. Um, Question about the local content, and I really like some of the ideas in there, and I'm wondering if you could give any insight to uh, a company that has local content, but our local services products, but also has a reach of online and digital products. And so how do you uh, have the local strategy, but not dilute the efforts of, you know, nationally or et cetera? Okay, let me think of a company. You know, I, I almost look at any e-commerce company that sells, uh, for instance, geez, now, can, can you give me an idea of the type of company that you're specifically working like with? Like the industry at least would be yeah. helpful, right? Yeah. Well, my, in my particular case, I work for a community college that does professional development and offer local professional development classes, but then they're also online for distance learning. Okay. So more informational yeah. products. Okay, so she, she has one that'll be relevant. Yes, I've actually consulted to that exact type of model. So, yeah. Um, what we found was useful was setting up, uh, we actually did information sessions in each of the cities where, even though it's an online class, so across Canada, they had a local event person who would run the information event and they just flew like the person across the country and did all these different sessions. And so we would have a session in Halifax and in Montreal and Quebec City and Toronto, et cetera. Um, and then we made sure that the local press knew about that the session was gonna be happening. And then we would write content about the local session. And then any questions that came out of the local session were of course great content resources, which we would use on a national level to get people excited about the product. But then individually in, in the cities, people were really interested in those individual sessions. And then we built up remarketing audiences to push future content out to those individual cities. So you say, here's the Montreal remarketing audience and here's the Saskatoon remarketing audience, et cetera. So a lot of it is you know, getting like boots on the ground in those particular cities in order to build those, uh, find out from people what they're asking about, but then building that into that national content strategy as well and taking the pieces out of that. Does that, does that help? Okay. You know, the, while not in the same industry, you know, one of the experience I've had that, that was really interesting was a company that, um, national brand, and they, they sell hundreds of millions of products uh, on a yearly basis, you know, or every few years, at least hundreds of millions, and they were very worried about pushing their local uh, their local content in fear that they would kill some of the e-commerce sales. The problem is they have thousands of locations across the country, but the web team was rewarded by the sales, the e-commerce sales, compared to driving any type of local traffic. And, and so in that case, it was more of a matter of making the right case to management to switch some of the goals and the alignment because they needed to understand that, that certain sales are going to take place locally. 
offline and you can't control that, but you still need to provide a wonderful experience for those people. And if you're rewarding a team opposite of that, then you're killing this whole opportunity for this local side. So it became more of trying to get um, the reward for the team set up correctly uh, so that they were, they, were, they were also rewarded for traffic to local pages compared to just e-com sales. And so it, just, just different cases, um, but I, I usually find that you, if the goals are off, it will create awful outcomes in, in the long run. So, so that was what we did in, in a case like that. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Thanks, that's great stuff, guys. Um, I have a question about creating content for uh, like professional businesses, uh, service-based businesses, um, say like a, a, an accounting firm or a, or a chiropractor or a lawyer or something like that that's not necessarily generating anything interesting. Um, is, is the content interesting? Yeah, I, I, no. Can you span, stand up? I can't see you. Yeah, sure. I mean, no. I mean, I think the content is not very interesting for yeah. like a, a bankruptcy lawyer. Okay. So, I, we actually have a bankruptcy lawyer as a client. So I'd love to hear, um, you know, your strategy yeah, for yeah. creating, you know, how do you create interesting content for, for somebody who's not doing anything that exciting yeah, to the general Yeah, you know, public. I got to be honest. So I've, we've had an accounting client for 12 years, like pre-Kickpoint, I work with these people. I did their very first website, and then I did their second website and their third website, and they're still a client. And getting them to blog, I can't even tell you how painful it was. I finally just had to sit them down one day and say, you will not be successful unless you do not blog, and I will stop working with you. And then they were like, okay, we'll blog. And they have something like 12 partners at this firm, so every partner has to do a blog every 12 weeks. Uh, and we do the topics in advance, and it's like, you guys, you can write, and of course, you know, when tax season comes, it all gets thrown out the window, it's all hands on deck, right? Um, but a lot of it is coming up with the topics for them, getting them to write about it, because obviously they're very knowledgeable about things that I do not know, because I hate accounting. Uh, but then at the end of it, before we publish, it comes back to us, and then we make it in their brand voice, because all these different partners obviously have different brand voices. And then we identify opportunities for injecting a little bit of interest into the subject. And that, that part of it is critical. You can't take a client who's going to write boring stuff and let them just publish on their own, because it's going to be boring, and nobody's going to want to engage with it. But sometimes, some of the most interesting pieces are stuff like um, insurance requirements for this specific tax in Canada called HST. Like That is one of their biggest organic traffic drivers out of anything we've ever published for them. It's three years old at this point. It's still their number one landing page from organic traffic. People love it. And so we just keep going back to that and making it better and making it better and making it better. The original partner who wrote it has left the firm. doesn't matter. We still keep <laughs> pushing stuff to this one particular piece. And a lot of it is finding out the kinds of questions that people ask after reading this specific piece. And then we just keep building it out more. Uh, and so it started out as kind of this meh, sort of content piece. And then it's become awesome over time because we just keep giving it love. So sometimes, too, you just need to go back to what you already have, do that content audit, identify pieces. Uh, that are of interest. So I talked about content audit as my local up presentation, which is also on SlideShare, and went through our content audit process on how to take clients who've already been blogging, but it's maybe it's a little bit sad, and made that better. And I think that that's, do you want to add to that? Um, Does that help? So we have lots of lawyer clients in about every type of legal niche you could imagine. And what, what I found is that boring content usually means that you're not appealing to the audience for what they're looking for. But, but the, the frequently asked questions that lawyers get are not boring to the people that need that information. They're, they're looking for specific answers, and even if it is not like the most engaging or fun thing to talk about, they need the answers to these questions. They need the answers to the tax questions. They need the answers to divorce uh, cases. You know, they need this info. So that's good info. But for attracting people and helping to build a brand before they need that info, you have to think outside of the professional services. And that's where it, it becomes being local. Why can't a lawyer be the, the know-how activity guy? Like if I'm a divorce lawyer, my whole pitch is going to be keeping families together, 
but that's not going to work out and they're going to come to me when it doesn't. But I'm going to talk about family activities a lot, different things and trying to say, and, and, and so the whole idea of the, the activities at Christmas time, that would work for a lawyer. Um, you know, that, there's, there's all of these different things that you can do and as long as you have one relevant point with them, which is the location, then the content is still relevant. So you can talk about the location, you can talk about things happening, that, and it does not have to be related to law. You're just trying to get to know them. The lawyers I know, I don't know through law, I know from community events. I know from their involvement in different things. And, and they talk about those things and they just need to transition the, the talks from those events they're involved into offline to the online world. Uh, so, so get out of talking about accounting or law um, for, for finding new potential customers and just talk about the city. Um, do fun pieces about that location. Okay. Uh, we probably have time for one more quick question if someone has a quick one. All right. Great. Cool. Uh, first off, thanks, guys. That was really good talks, actually. Um, I hadn't heard of most of the tools that you guys were talking about, so I was wondering if you can give maybe a couple more that, you know, are either relevant to content or maybe just ones that, like you can't live without that you think people should know about. Um, I just started using this new tool called Link Risk, and is anybody here using it? Like I, yeah, okay. Is it not fantastic? All right. So Link Risk, it's based in the UK. Um, the sales guy Ridian is really really nice. Uh, so <laughs> the way that Link Risk works is you hook it up to your Ahrefs and your Majestic and you can import uh, Open Site Explorer and hook it up to Webmaster Tools and then it imports um, all of your links from all these different platforms and then lets you know when you have new links as well so you get an email notification when new links are added which I find enormously helpful for my clients because then I can just let her run and so for example for the conference center when a uh, news website links to us, hey, there it goes, and when it disappears again. There's lots of other tools like investigating. It helps you with your um, disavow files and all that kind of crap too, but I find it most useful for that kind of notifications. The other thing that I use a lot is um, mention.com, and we'll put in uh, different keywords, when we're, especially when we're researching a topic in depth. So for example, right now we have a mention.com running on uh, Crash Dice Edmonton. If anybody talks about that, we need to know immediately uh, so we can leap on that for uh, opportunity. So, and it's also really good for competitor tracking. Um, you can also use things like that for, uh, if you're thinking about local specifically, it's also really useful for citation tracking to see if your competitors get a new citation somewhere that doesn't involve a link, you'll get a notification of that and then you can look into that for yourself. Um, that's, I, I think that mention and link risk are the two tools that I'm most excited about right now. And then in general for social, we use a tool called uh, Rival IQ, which is also that's very, very so good. Awesome. Yeah, Rival IQ. Rival IQ is the shit. Uh, one of our, so for the conference center again, one of their uh, competitors, a conference center in Ottawa, uh, got renamed, new ri naming rights were sold. We knew about it before the client knew about it. And to be able to email the client and be like, hey, did you know that this just happened in Ottawa and they are also called the Shaw Center now? Boy, this is gonna be awkward. Let's go and steal other Twitter handles. Um, Totally don't tweet that. I did that. <laughs> Rival, Rival IQ. IQ. Yeah. Rival IQ. Um, but to be able to email the client and let them know something that they didn't know yet makes you look like a friggin' superstar. So I will pay for Rival IQ forever just for that one thing. It is, it's amazing. And it emails you too. Like if a competitor has a breakout Facebook post or something, they'll email you about it. Um, so we found out that one of the competitors is having a, I won't say male strippers. Um, yeah, maybe it is, at another conference center. And so that's their breakout Facebook post, and we sent it on the client being like, hey, this is what the client did. This is why their engagement went up 7,000%. So, yeah, really useful stuff. I can do a little demo after this at the break if people want to take a peek behind it, because it's what? awesome. Yep. Of what? Oh, maybe not so, the strippers. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, so these guys are around, as Dana said. Uh, we're going to end it right there. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping items uh, to talk about. Um, first of all, the slide decks are available at sempdx.org slash 2015 slides. And the password for that is sempdx15. Can you hear that again? Uh, yep, sempdx.org slash 2015 slides. Password SEMPDX15, all lowercase. So that's where the slide decks are. Uh, complete the SearchFest survey that you'll receive uh, after the event's over today for a chance to win a ticket to next year's SearchFest. 
Um, really want to thank Yext again for sponsoring this session and this entire track. Um, and thanks to our speakers for uh, two great presentations and a terrific Q&A. Thanks a lot.